Okay, so um, I'm Raf Alvarado. I'm a professor, associate professor of data science at the University of Virginia School of Data Science. I teach courses on text analytics and programming for data science. And my background is actually anthropology. I was trained as an anthropologist, uh, but I've been a career digitally humanist uh, ever since getting my PhD. And uh, relatively later in my career, I pivoted into data science, pretty much as the field of digital humanities sort of started to embrace that field. And so I approach data science from a kind of a humanistic and an anthropological perspective. And actually, that's pretty relevant to today's talk, because what I'm going to do today is uh, do what I call situating large language models. Everybody knows that large language models have hit the news with chat GPT just in the last few months has become uh, a phenomenon. It's actually really hard to overestimate the importance of large language models because these things, along with a class of other generative AI models, are doing things uh, that look pretty much like generalized intelligence. At least that's what it kind of looks like. Um, but um, so there's a lot of giddiness out there. There's a lot of people saying, oh, wow, you know, we're really at, at the next level now. Everything has changed. This is going to have a huge influence on labor markets and so on and so forth. Uh, but there have been obviously criticisms and so forth. So let me begin with one of those and, and use this to sort of frame my talk. So here's a quote from Noam Chomsky, who by some measures is probably the most or one of the most influential intellectuals of the late 20th century, uh, a known you know, linguist, uh, MIT professor, also a uh, critic of uh, American foreign policy and so forth. Anyway, in a recent article in the New York Times, he wrote an op-ed and he had this to say, we fear that the most popular and fashionable strain of AI, machine learning, will degrade our science and debase our ethics by incorporating into our technology a fundamentally flawed conception of language and knowledge. So a little backstory here. Uh, Chomsky in the 1950s revolutionized linguistics uh, by positing that there is a language generating mechanism in the human brain that's genetically uh, de deployed, as it were, and universal. And in the process, he completely shifted the field, uh, pretty much initiated the paradigm shift away from certain methods that were becoming popular at the time, more behaviorist methods, uh, statistical methods, actually. Um, and so it's easy to kind of view this as, you know, a kind of a sour grapes where Noam Chomsky is saying that, um, you know, this linguistics that I've been championing over the years and which has kind of fallen into a little bit of disfavor uh, is being occluded now by the very sort of uh, kind of linguistics that he was attempting to supplant. But it's actually much more trenchant than that. It's much deeper. Um, to my mind, uh, the real issue that he's raising and that everyone should be asking in order to understand the impact of these uh, language models in this kind of AI is really what conception of language and knowledge do they entail? What, what, when we use ChatGPT and we say that it's, that it's thinking or that it's producing an idea or that it's being creative, what do we really mean by that? Uh, what, what standards can we apply uh, to assess the kind of so-called knowledge that it's producing? And really, underneath it all, what conception of language is it using, or are these tools using, that might help us understand language? So both of these questions are really important about the conception of language and knowledge, and that's what I want to address in this talk today. But I first want to motivate with some examples. I'm sure everyone's sort of played with ChatGPT already, and so I'm going to give you a couple of tests that I've done with the tool to give a sense of sort of the, uh, the edge points uh, in the space, as it were, of what it can do. So the first one is, and this is very popular, uh, our students are all doing this. This is to use it to write programming code. Uh, so basically it's write code to do some work for you. And what I had it do basically was, was uh, do one of my assignments in the class that I teach, one of the first assignments that I have my students do, which is to write a Python script to scrape Jane Austen's persuasion from Project Gutenberg. And the, and the goal of this project is, is to just go on the web, take this file, download it, parse it, and put it into a data frame. And the data frame has a particular structure to it. So the first thing it did was this. It created a pretty nice um, uh, script that actually works. Uh, well, well, actually, I should say it appears to work. Uh, but you can see that it's doing the right thing. It's, it's importing two libraries that are essential to this task, the request library and the beautiful soup library. Uh, and it gives the basic commands of just getting the URL and it found the URL. You'll see that that URL up there is accurate. It downloads it and then it, uh, pretty much um, uh, copies it to a, a variable and shows you what the results are. 
But if you run it, you'll see that it runs into an error. So it got this wrong, actually. Um, but the cool thing about ChatGPT is that even though it got, got some of it wrong, you can ask it to fix the code and it will do it. So in this case, I say, hey, you know, you got this wrong and I cut and paste the, uh, the error code. And here you have a, a revised version. It actually apologizes to you because ChatGPT is actually trained to respond or to, to, to speak this way. Um, so it, it, uh, it gives a, a, a different version, slightly different version, and this one works. So it actually downloads the whole text and, and there it is and it presents it to you. But I wanted it to do more. So basically I, I gave it a series of prompts to get increasingly more difficult or to accomplish increasingly more difficult tasks until it actually completed the tasks that my students uh, would complete. And this is what it ends up with. This is exactly what I wanted it to do more or less uh, is to create a data frame where you have uh, in the rightmost column every token in the text as a separate observation and in for each observation there's an index indicating the location of that token in the text so you can see there are four parts of that index it's in a chapter it's in a paragraph it's in a sentence and there's a token number and that's what i want the students to do because when you put data into this format then you can do all kinds of things with it so it accomplished this and it also created a, um, a class that I could then save and use and other things. It generalized it so I could just pass it a, uh, a, um, an ID and it would, um, it would then pick whatever you know, Gutenberg file is associated with that ID. So it was pretty cool. Um, there were some limitations to it, but I won't go into those. The other thing I asked to do is to write a poem on an unusual topic. This is a fun thing to do. Get some topic like, say, quantum physics or you know, uh, you know, behavioral economics, and have it write uh, uh, an explanation of it in some crazy genre like you know a Taylor Swift song or something like that, and it will do it. So what I had to do is write a sonnet explaining the nature of transformer models, which is a kind of large language model, uh, and it pretty much did it. It uh, got the sonnet form, which if you know your Shakespeare is 14 lines. It's got three stanzas of four with a concluding couplet. And I'm not going to read this, but uh, it's pretty good. It rhymes well, and it's, uh, it's kind of compelling. It's funny. Um, and it just did the job perfectly, actually. So the last task I, I gave it was to do something about the real world. So I asked it to write a biography of a real person. So a lot of people do this. You go to ChatGPT and say, hey, write a biography of me. So I said, write a biography of Rafael C. Alvarado, currently professor of data science at the University of Virginia. Um, which is a prompt that focuses it not just on any Rafael C. Alvarado, of which there are many in the world, uh, but on one specific person, because there's no one else, obviously, in the School of Data Science with that name. And here's what it did. It generated the biography that uh, made, uh, that looks reasonable, but which is complete nonsense. You know, it says that I was born in Mexico City, that I went to uh, Cal Berkeley, got a PhD in 19... 96. I had positions at Minnesota. I've been UVA faculty since 2003. And it's all wrong. It's all completely made up. Um, and uh, I asked it again to do it because you can ask it to regenerate and it made up more stuff. This time I came from Brown. The interesting thing is that I think you'll see in both cases, uh, I'm born in Mexico, uh, which I think is based, it's, it's an evi evidence of bias because I think most people named Alvarado represent on the internet probably are from Mexico, I'm assuming. Uh, but that's what it did. Um, so it got all that completely wrong. Uh, it also, you know, I thought I would try to avoid factual errors by giving it a prompt. Apparently there's this whole, or there is this whole field called prompt engineering, where you get really specific about your prompting and uh, it's gonna give you better and better results. Like you ask it to do certain things, like in the manner of a Harvard professor, give me an explanation for what, whatever, and it'll, it'll do it intelligently, for example. So I asked it to give me sources and it gave me these, it came with these two sources. They're not really sources, they're just URLs. Uh, but both of them, I'll point out, are formally correct. They're in the canonical form of those URLs. That's how UVA's uh, faculty homepages used to look. And also, that's a Google Scholar URL. But both URLs are completely made up. They don't point to anything. And also, it did not get my um, you know, UVA ID, which is RCA2T, instead it picked RCA5B. So that's kind of interesting. Finally, I'm not going to show you these things, but I do want to say that there are other versions of GPT-based tools, such as AutoGPT, which do a lot more than ChatGPT. ChatGPT is kind of so-called old school now because there's bigger language models like GPT-4, and there are all kinds of tools which sort of harness these language models 
to do things for people and to actually complete the task. Like, give me a business report on something, uh, write it up into a markdown file, convert it to a web page, and put it on the web for me. And these tools will do that. So I, I have here just a tweet from somebody who is you know, sort of championing all the things that these tools can do. Um, and I would put the things that I have listed here pretty much in the first category of being able to write code for you, but doing it in a more sophisticated way. So here's the deal. Uh, we can conclude from these experiments, and this is something you know that I've gotten um, examples of from other people as well, and obviously this isn't really systematic, but we can see that it's pretty good at writing code, right? It can write code, it, writes, it, it understands how to write uh, software that works, especially with some prompts. It also can write text in proper form. So, you know, it got the sonnet down, it understood what a sonnet is, but it also does a lot of other things really well. It's good at legal code. Um, I don't know if the code is compliant with respect to specific legal standards, but if you ask it to write a law about something, it's going to do a pretty good job. It's going to have it all numbered and indented. It'll have all the uh, remedies and all the uh, specific ways that you break the law. It's pretty amazing what it can actually do. It'll do things like love letters. It'll do things like resumes. Pretty much anything for which there are established examples of a document type on the web. That, that's how I uh, conceive of this. But the thing that it fails at, when it fails pretty miserably, is that content. We know that it basically makes stuff up, or it appears to quote unquote make stuff up. We call these hallucinations. Uh, and, uh, and it looks like it's just paying attention to creating things that look good, right? That, that, uh, that are formally, or excuse me, that are grammatically correct and rhetorically correct, but which are wrong. And it'll even make up citations, as we saw. So the paradox is, I mean, the question we have to ask ourselves, and this is sort of our clue to getting at, well, what is the conception of language that it's working with? And how is it related to truth and knowledge? Um, is how are these two things possible? How do they coexist? How is it possible to be good at one thing and bad at the other? Good at form, bad at content, right? Good at meaning, say, bad at truth. Um, what I want to propose is that in really to understand how this is possible, you need to understand how language models work themselves, what they are, because these things aren't new. I mean, they, the, the specific language model architecture called the transformer architecture, which we'll look at really quickly, is new. That, that was pretty much uh, devised in 2017. Uh, not not whole cloth, but but the architecture that we're using now in GPT-4 and BERT and all that stuff, 2017. But language models themselves go back really far. Uh, and they, they stand for a basic sort of a task within natural language processing. So we're going to look at what, what that is and then look at the assumption on which these new models are based. And from there, we can sort of get a sense of, well, what are, why are they performing well in this area and not in that area? Um, so let's do that. But in order to do that, I would, would like to first, you know, you know, uh, introduce some vocabulary to help us understand what a language model is and what is what the specific kind of language model that these uh, large language models in, instantiate are. So the first thing to really understand about language models is to understand what language is. Um, and this is a concept that goes back to the early 20th century. Uh, if you've ever taken anthropology or literary criticism or linguistics, you're familiar with the work of Ferdinand Saussure, a French linguist and semiotician who came up with this idea that language actually consists of two broad areas. He's French, so he's calling them langue and parole. We can think of those as grammar and discourse. So these are different levels of language, if you will. So grammar, what that actually stands for, is the set of rules that are presumably in our brains that generate sentences. They're finite, there's only a small number of them, and they're collective in the sense that we all share them or else we would not be able to communicate. Language has to be social to be language uh, because it's designed to communicate and therefore it has to be shared in order to work. And these grammars are often, well, they are latent. No one's ever gotten into the human brain and actually uh, seen a grammar you know, constructed from neurons. We may be on that path, but we model that grammar uh, with everything from grammar books that use in grade school to Chomsky's theory of generative grammar. But the other level is discourse, and discourse consists of the actual collection or, or the observed sentences that we produce using grammar. So these are infinite, as Chomsky pointed out. Um, there is no limit on the number of sentences that can be produced because you can always add a clause to any given sentence that you specify. It's like a Cantor uh, infinite set. There's a rule for always showing how it can get bigger. So it's infinite, and it's individual in the sense that we all own our own sentences. And in fact, our sentence structures 
uh, if, you, if you talk enough, you will provide uh, enough evidence to do a stylistic analysis on your speech pattern to identify that it's you. So it's very individual in that sense. The other thing is that discourse is always given as text, even though the, the sort of primary form of discourse is speaking, it really only exists as text when you're analyzing it. In order to analyze discourse, even if you're videotaping someone talking and you're trying to get speech patterns, at some point you're writing that down and transcribing it into text, a series of material signs that are then analyzed. Okay, it's really important to understand that because that becomes the data of a language model. Uh, the second thing is that texts are always produced by a speech community or discourses. Discourse always comes from some speech community within which certain ways of speaking, certain assumptions about the world, certain, you know, uh, all the conditions necessary to, to speak and uh, which provide uh, the content about what you're speaking uh, come from. So the speech community actually provides all that. That's to say there's no such thing in a certain sense as English. English is, is, a root, is, a, is a term that covers a whole bunch of speech communities which interoperate, but there's no sort of universal English, even though people might want to think of it that way. So uh, the, just unpacking these terms a little bit, a text is, is a series of symbol tokens drawn from a, a set of uh, symbol types. This isn't super important to grasp here, but just to understand uh, this, this second line here I have, that text is the data from which grammar is inferred. So remember we talked about text and grammar. Grammar seems like it's a priority because it generates discourse. But in reality, discourse is the only thing that we see. It's the only thing that we actually observe in the world. It is the data on which we use to infer grammar. Grammar, in a certain sense, doesn't exist. It's hypothetical. It's like a statistical model. It's like a parameter that you're trying to estimate with the data. And I'll skip over the, the other things in this list here because they're not necessary for this talk. Um, visually, this is how I represent it, just so you can have a, a sense in your mind of how these things break down. Language is broken down into long and parole, which are the same as grammar and discourse. Grammar is associated with language models, the thing that we're trying to, to develop. And on the right, you have discourse, which is broken down to speech and writing. But speech and writing both end up in documents or texts, and text consists of these three features. Text consists of symbols, that are um, uh, put into a sequence and by virtue of that sequence have patterns that we use to study. And from those patterns, we infer things like grammars and all that kind of stuff. So this is the reality that, 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 that you know, we have when we're building language models. We never actually have access to grammars. We infer them from the sequence of symbols that uh, a text is made of, okay? And here's just a final visualization to show you the relationship between long and parole uh, in terms of the, 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 the sort of areas of artificial intelligence that tend to get associated with language. So on the, on the left, we have natural language processing, which tends to be focused on reproducing or creating grammars, uh, programs that have the property of generating speech and understanding speech. And on the right, we have text mining, which I'm calling TM here, which is the whole domain of practices and you know, methods devoted toward mining text as text, in other words, big collections of libraries, of written text, of, of, you know, Twitter feeds, all these things that are just huge deposits of spoken language, which have nothing to do with grammar per se. They're, they're, in other words, you don't find grammars in there. All you find is text. And text mining is designed to sort of mine those and find patterns in those. So text mining provides the data that natural language processing uses. And NLP often provides the tools that people use in text mining. So this important thing here is to realize this is more of a reinforcement of the idea that these really are two different aspects of language. You have grammar on the one side, and you have discourse on the other. And in fact, our principal ways of dealing with language from AI are broken down in this way as well. So let's move on to language models then, given those terms. And in the upper right, you see a, a, a next case CD uh, comic uh, describing essentially what a language model is. You have somebody there trying to predict the next letters of this word, and she's obviously getting it wrong. And that speaks to the fact that a language model really is, um, a, a, as, as traditionally defined, a model that allows you to predict the, ne predict the next word of a sentence. So if you're looking at text and, you, and, and it cuts off somewhere, or if somebody is speaking into uh, a, an iPhone, a language model is there to predict or anticipate the next word, okay? So we've seen this before with auto completion and things like that, or, or speech to text. 
Uh, but this concept goes back really far. And um, there are a lot of ways to try to model this, this, this uh, phenomenon so that it can be predicted. And basically, there are two main ways of doing this. One of them is probabilistic, and that is you develop a probability model of how language behaves and use that to predict what a next word is. And you, and, you, and you get your probabilities from you know, huge sources of text. And the other is what we'll call discriminant. And basically what that means is things like neural networks that really don't uh, employ uh, uh, generative language models in the way that we were used to thinking of within statistics. A, a neural network is just going to infer a whole bunch of weights that allow it to predict something. Uh, and what those weights are can be turned into probabilities, but they're essentially discriminant. Um, um, the key thing is both of them, both probabilistic and discriminative models, are trained on, on text or discourse, as, as we've seen. So large language models are basically neural network models, that is to say they come from the discriminant tradition, uh, designed to solve the same problem of, of, uh, of predicting the next word in a sentence. Um, but they do it with these huge models that have billions of weights, trillions of weights, actually. GPT-4 has trillions of weights. It's a neural network, trillions of, of synapses, if you will. Um, and it, it is able to infer information about next words and actually, I'm jumping ahead here, but next sentences and things like that by training on the entire corpus of the internet in principle. Obviously, it's not doing everything on the internet, but it takes huge chunks of text from the internet and uh, uses that to train. But in principle, it's doing the same thing that these other models, these older models used to do. And so this right here is a quick history, you know, going back to where this all gets started and just showing you that these large language models are in this tradition. Uh, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but I just want to point out to you that, you know, you have an initial attempt to create language models and things like that as far back as 1906, when Markov chains are invented by the Russian Markov. Uh, and he actually demonstrated the, the Markov model, which is a model designed to predict whether a consonant or vowel will follow a given consonant or vowel. He's working at the character level. He, he, he did the math to do this uh, with a particular novel, Pushkin's Eugene, Oregon, back in 1913. Uh, this later became the foundation for Claude Shannon's model of language, which was really the important piece of his uh, information theory article in 1948. Um, we have these other developments as well. I'm going to jump ahead here to 1986, where neural networks become popular again. They become, um, they, they, you know, the sort of the, the winter of AI, as we sometimes call it, during the 70s after neural networks were sort of poo-pooed, uh, uh, came back and were, were actually seen to be pretty useful and were able to solve certain problems. And so we end up with this recurrent neural network, which is a really key uh, architecture of network neural network designed to process sequences of terms. We have improvements over of neural networks with long short-term memory. Um, and then in 2013, and this is where things really heat up with respect to the language models that we're going to talk about. And this, this particular innovation is essential to understanding ChatGPT and these other uh, current uh, batch of language models, is that a particular way of representing language that went beyond the previous ways was developed. And this is what's called, um, you know, the, the, the um, particular model was called word to vec but it's really called skip gram negative sampling. And it's based on this idea of skip grams, that you can model language based on a small window of where that word appears in a text. So what you basically do is you take every word and you find the word that precedes it by one or two, and you save that and get statistics on that. We'll look at that a little bit more. But that's pretty much the foundation of these models, which enables it to do things, to do the things that it does. Eventually, we end up with these other inventions, uh, something called attention uh, and something called sequence to sequence learning, which later contribute to this architecture called the transformer architecture, which is what allows for these models to be built. Because for the first time, these models are able to represent language in a way that really effectively allows you to predict next words and also higher dis discursive units like next sentences, uh, but also do it efficiently because the, um, the, the uh, uh, positional embedding model, which I actually don't have listed here, and some other sort of tweaks to how this stuff is built allowed for this, uh, these networks to be performant because before they worked, but they didn't perform very well, and they had issues of losing the memory of previous words and things like that. But those problems were solved uh, in, in the preceding years. And so by 2017, we end up with this transformer architecture. And then after that is invented, 
all of these, these models come out. GPT comes out in 2018, Google announces BERT, GPT comes out in 2019, and here we see uh, further iterations of the transformer timeline. You may have heard of Distillbert or BART or T5. Just a whole bunch of these models come out because, it, because the transformer model, once it was invented, made it possible to develop all these really large scale models by integrating those innovations that I just described. Um, and finally, here I talk about, I, I show you that the, uh, you know, it's pretty recent, March 2023, that we have Chat GPT 4, that we have GPT 4 and ChatGPT only came out last fall. It's, it's pretty amazing having come out so recently. And even, you know, I was just reading an article about the, um, by the creators of ChatGPT, they had no idea that it would have such an influence. They knew it was a big deal when they were creating it, but they had already put out something else prior to this called InstructGPT, didn't make waves. Uh, and when they put this out, they had no idea the, the uptake that it would have. Uh, and uh, so we're living in this sort of giddy era of, of, wow, what can these things do? And it's really quite recent. Here's just a quick uh, graph showing you how big these models have gotten and how much development there has been. The key idea, as you can see, it's an exponential graph where the number of parameters keeps increasing exponentially. So now we're working on you know, trillions of parameters in the chat GPT model. They're expected to get exponentially bigger to that. Um, there may be a ceiling to that, but uh, no one has actually specified that. So here's what I want to, I want to pause here. There's that history. I want, you, I want uh, to sort of put this all together and point out that what we have when we're talking about a language model is really the combination of a, a few small things that have been around for a long time, but which together make it possible to have these. Uh, and so that we can sort of demystify them a little bit and sort of look under the hood and look at the, the particular mechanism that's at work that allows these things to produce uh, you know, discourse that looks like knowledge, okay? The first is the data. So, this gets uh, sort of um, elided a little bit in, in narratives about uh, ChatGPT and these, these language models, but really these things are only possible with the internet. So the, the size of the text data bases that we have, what we call the corpora of data, because of the internet, which has basically been collecting textual data since the early 90s, and even before that when the internet wasn't the web, uh, when the web wasn't yet invented, uh, it had been collecting textual data for years and years and years. And we, by, by now, in our databases, Wikipedia, Internet Archive, uh, Google Search, almost anything on the web, uh, uh, you know, social media platforms have accumulated vast troves of spoken language transcribed into text uh, or discursive uh, language. Um, no linguist before the 1990s could even dream of having a, a, a fraction of this amount of information. If you look at the text corpora that were used before this for language models, they, 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 were, they were just trivially small in comparison. They weren't worthless, but they were just really small. So we have this huge amounts of data. The second thing is there were really genuine innovations in how to represent this textual data that I just mentioned in the history. Uh, and the most important ones are the sentence embedding model that I talked about, the word to vec but also positional embedding, which allowed for the efficient uh, development of the neural networks that process sequential data. Uh, and so you had those two inventions, and we'll place those around 2017 uh, when they get combined into the transformer model. And then we also have the technological capacity to stand up massive neural networks. So independently of language models, none of this would happen if it weren't possible to stand up a language model with trillions of parameters or any kind of model. And that kind of technology has been developing over the years, you know, because of uh, all of the sort of engines of commerce on the internet that are driving everything, you know, Google's ad platform, everything, you know, Twitter, Facebook, all of these, um, all of these platforms which process tons of data and which, you know, have to manage uh, petabytes of data, you know, beyond the capability of traditional databases to handle and all this kind of stuff. That is all in place so that the, the, the model envisioned uh, in 2017, the transformer model, was able to integrate the data that was available and the technology that was available to produce these products, okay? So that's why we have them now. The reason they exist now is because it's possible to have that much data and to have a model that big actually running. But at the kernel of it, what I wanna point out is, is uh, in that column on representation, it all depends on a particular theory of meaning or of linguistic meaning. And we're going to, this meaning has actually got a name. It's called the distributional hypothesis. And I'm going to explain that real quick here. 
So the distributional hypothesis is, is just the theory uh, developed by uh, Zelig Harris in 1954, although it has precedence before that. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein can be said to have come up with this as well. And the idea is that instead of thinking about the meaning of words as, as that which a word points to, which is sort of our common sense notion of meaning, we say, what did you mean by that? Well, you'll reference something, either something in the world or some emotion that you had or some goal that you're trying to achieve. There's something outside of language, extra linguistic, that that sign points to. And it's a fundamental theory of meaning, actually, uh, that meaning is referenced. That is a standard theory of meaning. But the idea from this school of thought was that, no, if you want to study language statistically, uh, you, you can't actually access all those things because all we have is text. What we can access is the, what, what we'll call the company that a word keeps. So if I want to know the meaning of a word, all I need to know is what words it tends to be associated with in, 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 uh, in the sentence. So for example, if I don't know what the word Sunday means, but I see that it's used in all of the same places that Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday are used, then I can reasonably guess, oh, well, that's probably a day of the week too. Um, and that's obviously a really simple example. But just the idea that, that you know, you can just look for the context of word use, meaning literally the word before and after, or the two words before and after, that's pretty much all you need is to capture meaning. Um, and so that's what these tools do. They basically uh, keep track of what used to be called keywords in context. They, they kind of keep a concordance of all the, all the context in which a word exists. And they, uh, based on all of those contexts, are able to derive statistics, predictive statistics, about what, you know, uh, what a word's uh, next word will be or what a word's context will be. Uh, and this also applies to higher units of discourse that we're not going into here, but the same logic applies to what is the next sentence based on what sentences uh, a sentence belongs with. So a simple way of looking at it is this. This is uh, taken from the web. Uh, I, I have a citation on the slide deck, uh, but it's just a simple representation of what we mean by uh, the, the bag of the sliding or the skip gram representation, which is like a sliding bag of words. You can see in the first case, we have a window size of two and every word within a sentence is, is uh, associated with its, with its uh, partner words, if you will. And you can see on the side, in the third column, you have skip grams. And essentially what these models do is take all of the text they can and create a huge database of skip grams. And on the basis of that, are able to assign probabilities to these relationships. And then based on those probabilities, they can do the things that they do. So here's what I wanted to observe about this. Uh, first of all, um, the discourse you know, produced by large language models, this should be obvious, uh, is not produced by you know, direct experience on the part of the language model. It's not produced by anything that we might call thinking. It's not produced by um, anything other than the fact that these sentences are coherent with respect to the database that they have. They're basically taking, uh, you know, making uh, judgments about what words a word goes with based on all this data that they have. And so they're going to be really good at creating sentences that sound grammatical because um, basically, you know, the position of a word in a sentence, you know, follows from its grammar. So you're going to, it's going to produce very, very, very grammatical and formally correct stuff. But at no point is it connected to reference, right? Because in the beginning, it's sort of a deal with the devil, which is that we're going to look at meaning purely in terms of its distribution with respect to other words. We're not going to pay attention to reference. Uh, and we don't even know how we would do that if, if we wanted to, right? So when we, when we see a text come back to us, we shouldn't be surprised that all it's doing is presenting to us a grammatically correct uh, uh, instance of discourse and that, that it's completely unconnected to, to any kind of reality because it was never designed, there's no mechanisms to deal with reality at all. I should qualify that, which is that um, the way that reality comes into the picture is that these models are often trained uh, in an adversarial way where uh, if the sentence produces something, it can be challenged either by another chatbot or by a human saying, that's wrong, that doesn't exist, that, that's not something you should say. So it goes back and doesn't say that anymore. And it will then produce uh, sentences that tend to get agreement from people. But you can see that's, that's not really truth in the sense that we understand it, where you know, our way of judging truth is, were you there? Did you see it? Or did you conduct an experiment? Do you have notes on what you did? Not like, oh, gee, I shouldn't say that again. Let me say another sentence and see if the person gets mad. 
you know. So that's that's really what's going on here. They're they're uh, they're just producing these coherent uh, uh, sentences based on the data that they have. The other thing I want to point out to you is that um, as a category of data product, and that's really a useful way of thinking about these. They're, they're a whole new category of data product uh, for which we're still learning the uses, and people are monetizing right now and so forth. Um, the thing to understand is. They're not really language models. They're missold, I think, as by being called language models. Sure, they're large, and sure, they're language models in that they come from this space where the goal was to predict next words, but they've gone way beyond that in terms of what they can predict. They predict not just next words, but as I've been sort of indicating, they predict next discursive units, like next sentences, next paragraphs, and things like that. So they're not really language models in the traditional sense, uh, the textbook sense that you'll see. And nor are they grammars, which is a, a supposedly a synonym for, for, for language model, uh, because no grammar book with a trillion rules is a grammar, right? That, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't meet any of the requirements that any reasonable person would have for what a grammar is. Uh, they're not a finite set of intelligible rules that govern speech and writing. I think it's better to think of them uh, as what I have here in the last line, as generative concordances. In other words, the, 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 the language model itself is a vast index of, 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 of keywords and context. And it's able to recombine those based on the, the prompts that it's given, the input parameters that it's given. And it will generate you know, probabilistic outputs based on that. But basically what it's doing is, is it's, it's a kind of a recombinant hypertext. It is generating uh, 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 meaningful prose based on this vast index that it has in, 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 in the network itself. Um, and so I actually question whether they're models uh, either. They're neither language models nor models because a model in the traditional sense, what a statistician would accept as a concept of a model, is something that can be separated from its data. So this is a foundational principle in statistics, which is that ideally your model should be independent of your data it should be conceived of independently, and you should seek out data to confirm it, to establish the parameters. And also, once you have your model, your data is there only to estimate parameters, and then not thrown away, but it's put to one side, and the model is the reality, right? These things don't meet that criteria at all. You cannot separate them from their data. Uh, the data is woven into them, and this is the problem people have had with neural networks to begin with and what makes them hard to generalize. But in this case, that principle is really present, that they do not generalize beyond their corpus, but that's not a problem because their corpora are so massive. They have huge corpora. And so what any given person brings to that corpus probably comes from the same speech community that generated those corpora to begin with, which is to say the internet. In other words, it's just to say that you're a member of a society that uses the internet. Um, but it's a little bit of a trick because it's doing this because it's actually storing all this information inside of it at, instead of having a real language model that has a grammar that's separated from some other faculty that stores knowledge, which was your more traditional way of organizing an AI that could speak. Um, so that's what I think of them as. They're, they're, they're pretty much generative concordances. Um, so uh, I'll conclude with this. This may seem a little bit like of a scandal, you know, where we say that uh, it's th these things don't actually have a connection to truth. They're just producing coherent sentences that are that that sound meaningful. But in reality, it's not a lot different than how we normally behave as humans and what educated people behave like. Because as educated people, basically what it means is we've mastered the use of a library, and so most of what we quote unquote know is our knowledge or our memory of what other people said. It's not direct experience in the sense of stuff we've learned on the job doing something or learned in a lab by doing direct scientific research or all of the other things that we consider to be direct sources of knowledge. Um, most of what we quote unquote know in academia is what we've read and we've organized it systematically in our heads and we have uh, uh, what the philosopher Hegel called coherency uh, but we don't have truth in the sense of its representation to the world because there's no way we could ever establish, uh, uh, you know, we, we could, there's no way that we could recreate the conditions to establish, you know, sort of representational truth of everything in our brains. Scientists try to do that. You know, when you teach physics, when, you know, when you learn physics 101, 
If I teach you Newton's uh, laws of mechanics, I will, as a professor, try to demonstrate them to you in the front of the class, right? With weights and things like that. But by and large, learning doesn't work that way. Uh, so really what they're doing is they are, these are discourse models that look like they're producing knowledge because knowledge is textually constituted for the most part, right? Knowledge is what we used to call in digital humanities a text-based application. But what's missing from that whole picture is, well, how does that knowledge relate to the world, right? And, and what we're finding is that, well, it really matters uh, uh, how knowledge relates to the world, how language relates to the world. And that's the problem that we're going to have to fix if we're going to actually use these or if these things are going to become truly useful in the sense of uh, knowledge producing tools. And obviously there are other ethical, huge ethical considerations to consider as well that I haven't touched on, but I'm just dealing with the epistemological part here. So I wanted to conclude with this one quote. This is from a colleague, uh, Ted Underwood, who's a professor of English. Uh, he's in the School of Information at uh, Illinois. And he has this interesting quote that he put in um, Facebook. He says, our mistake was to imagine that this was figurative. And this is a quote from John Milton, uh, you know, who wrote Paradise Lost. And he writes, for books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. Nay, they do preserve as in a vial the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them. In other words, books contain the echo of the mind that produced them. They are not the mind that produced them, but they definitely still contain sort of the energy and the, um, the intellect in, in, in a certain sense exteriorized in the text. And that is what these, these models are sort of exploiting. This vast trove of spoken language, sort of the fossils of human thought, sort of reconstituted into these things that look like human thought and which in fact may compel us to think further and may be meaningful to us in ways that we can act on and so forth. But at the end of the day, they're just texts. Uh, it, it's, it's really the work of the library that we're witnessing here in a kind of new way. So I'll conclude at that.